you can make your announcement. Now. Okay. So, uh, we <laughs> welcome everybody. It's a real pleasure for me and honor to have Brian and Francois here as my guests. And thank you, Celia and August, yeah. for introducing me to Brian. Your matchmaker. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the three of us, but uh, the three musketeers. Yeah, yeah. Well done, August. Yeah. Well Thank done. You. So I'm sure that it's going to be interesting, and I think I would like you to have the stage. Thank and you. I will act, and if there's something that um, doesn't to be yes. translated or yeah. repeated or something, so I'll, I'll yeah. do that then. Yeah, I, I, will, I will check if you understand. Because I know you're good at English, but some words have a different thought behind them and that they actually don't translate. So I want to be, I want to be very careful to get it right. Um, I don't attend talks on New Age things and spirituality because I find them rather boring. But I'm giving a talk about the talk. And it's not right. And it's the batteries down. No, it's okay. Right, I'm going to give a talk about giving talks. How many people here give talks, either in work or outside work? Right, it's very slow, very cautious. Thank you, thank you. That's, that's a real yes. Good, there were seven of you. Um, I have strong views about talks because they can be the best thing that can ever happen to a person or they can be torture for the brain. And it really depends on the subject matter of the talk. And I'm going to tell you this because it will determine the whole formula for this evening. There's a type of talk where an expert will talk. It could be a technological thing, for example, how to change the tyre. And your job there is to watch, not to say anything, to learn and to repeat. That's one type of talk. So the intervention required is so-called passive but attentive. Then you have another type of talk where, let's say, there's an adventurer, someone who's climbed Everest, and you haven't climbed Everest, so you listen to that slice of the challenge of the human, uh, to, the, to the human nature. And again, we're enjoying the thought of doing these amazing things. But it's, in a way, not passive, but just attentive. Then you have another type of talk, which is devotional or inspiration, where we're trying to get the right state of mind together. But there's the final type of talk where the subject matter, we can all contribute. We all know something. And that's the type of talk this evening. So if I were to drive you mad and bore you to death, I would give a 40-minute talk in which I would try to include all the points that I think are absolutely wonderful, and I must get it into the time. And that is so bad, and I'll tell you for why. Because if I talk about something that you are familiar with, your brain that loves to work like a greyhound dog, you have them here, greyhounds? You do, of course you do, um, will produce an idea. That's the brain, or a question, that's the brain's way of saying, hey, come on, I want to work. It's not often that I can play. It's not often that I can be listened to in the right environment. So what happens? The speaker goes on at great speed, blah, 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 and turning, blah, 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 blah. And after a few seconds, that a question, which the brain so desperately needs to have answered in order to move on, does not get asked. So you're, it's actually damaging, but you don't know it at the time. Then the same thing happens again. But what if, blah, 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 speaker goes on. And that is so bad. So, to avoid that, a speaker, whatever you speak about, should consider the type of audience, number one, and the type of subject matter. This is your duty of care. 
So if you've got an aware audience and a subject that is familiar to them, you turn from being an informer, someone who informs, you turn to being a facilitator. Because for a subject like stress, you need new information like a hole in the head. You don't need it. It's all there. But you do need to process it. Because if your mouth is full of undigested food, you can't eat more. And the key problem today is people who say, do you know, I'd love to say this or the other, but I'm worried about being laughed at or misunderstood. And that's such a killer. So while we have this bubble here, there's no question there is a bubble, and it's a very clean one, I might say. Thank you, Steffi. I'm praising him. Praise. Thank you. Take it. Um, we should take full advantage of, of it and bring about the changes that are required here while our energy fields can help each other. You know, they build on each other, do you see? If you step in the street, you've got the noise, whoosh. And a week later, you think, oh, I went to a talk. Oh, it was all right, you know. And then a month later, you even forgot. So in fact, unless you take advantage of the here and now, you can be wasting your time. Because mankind, humankind, is not designed to be a sponge, a passive sponge, but to activate each other through thinking and what you can't do on, on the internet is have energetic interaction. This is the key thing and the determination of so-called success, so-called failure of any group. So my job is to speak in order to listen. So I'm changing, I'm not giving information, not information, a bit. So I'm going to make what I call a, give you what I call a module which will last, say, five minutes, then we open it up. Then the processing happens. No processing, no benefit. It's as simple as that. And if you feel safe here to say something that you haven't said before, that is a real triumph. Because you won't believe how inhibited we are by thinking what other people might say. It's the same, unfortunately, in all societies. So I'm going to do my first little module. It lasts about four minutes. We're talking about sanity, which is from the Latin sanus, meaning healthy mental health, soundness of mind. Are we as a society sane or insane? What sane person says someone could live in this world and not be crazy? Now there's a very important contradiction here. I would suggest that you need to be a bit crazy to be sane. What is craziness? Is it a negative thing? What is sanity? Someone says, if you think anyone is sane, you just don't know enough about them. I like that one. That was written by someone called Christopher Moore in a book entitled Practical Demon Keeping, which I thought was rather good. Um, this is Terry Pratchett, who does the Monty Python. Inside every sane person, there is a madman struggling to get out. That's what I always thought. No one goes mad quicker than a totally sane person. See. Eric Fromm, who is a uh, psychologist, was, is, the sane society, that millions of people share the same forms of mental pathology doesn't make these people sane. Okay? And my favorite, from Frederick Nietzsche, and those who were seen dancing were thought to be insane by those who couldn't hear the music. Right. Now, this is so important, and I'm starting the important one straight away. What does it mean to maintain your sanity? It means far more than not conforming to other people's expectations. So if you do the opposite, it doesn't mean you're sane. All right. 
if expectations are based on something false, then you will become more and more insane by conforming. If we all go downhill at the same rate, we don't notice. There are many examples of the pressures put upon sane people in history. There was a physician called Ingas Simmelweitz, who worked at the Vienna General Hospital in the 1840s. He stated that dirty hands among medical people were the cause of infection and death and he was ignored ridiculed and sent to a psychiatric institution and these are intelligent people who are doing this human nature has not changed much since then if you address a friend or work colleague and there's something that you disagree with about their behavior you're not going to get a vote of thanks by drawing it to their attention because people want to stay the same you see People, people do not see it as an attempt to help. They do not see it as an attempt to help, but a criticism. An honest and straightforward person will therefore have great difficulty in, adjusted, in, in adjusting. Do you just keep quiet, but then you will not be true to yourself? So if you speak out, you're ostracized, maybe. If you keep it to yourself, you're less of a person. So would anyone care to share, and that's the end of the module one, would anyone care to share any experiences they found of speaking out? Obviously not. <laughs> you, you get the short straw, because you're the most extrovert. Yeah. Do, do you, are you a speaker outer? Hmm? Are you a person who speaks out? Well, yeah, but nowadays more and more. T tell me about your experience. Well, I'm, I'm open up quite a lot uh, during my work nowadays. Yes. My previous job was uh, quite punishing environment that you just uh, couldn't speak there, or anyone would have been uh, uh, shouting at you or punishing you or some, in some ways. But now that uh, I'm working in a healthy environment, I can speak up whatever I want. So yes. uh, no matter if it's my boss or my boss's boss or yes. whatever manager or director, I don't care. I just speak up. Yeah, that's brilliant. So that that's brings a very important point. The environment can be carcinogenic. Yeah. It can be just, a, it can be poisonous. Yeah. And even one person, even in a big group, can make it uh, very uh, negative and, uh, and uh, well, not so healthy environment if he or she is constantly there uh, criticizing each other's work or whatever. Yes, yes, so, yeah. yes. So you've moved yourself from an unhelpful environment to a helpful environment. Yeah. And really you couldn't change the environment you were in, so you had to move. Yeah. Correct, good, very good. Your brains will take about 10 minutes to get the idea that we're actually, you, you, the brains can actually grow, so don't worry about the silence. <laughs> silence is okay. Okay, Any, anyone else want to have a go? And don't forget, no one's going to laugh at you. We may laugh with you and take advantage of that because these are precious moments. Thank you. You get the short straw now because you laughed. Okay, what's your contribution? Well, talking about healthy or un unhealthy environments, I'm a uh, in, a, in an unhealthy one now, right now at work, which is causing me huge difficulties. And we are trying, we as a group, meaning my team, we are trying to sort of do something about it. Obviously, as you said, it's not so appreciated by the person no. who is Never will the be. target. Never will be. Who happens to be my boss, of course, <laughs> to make it classic. So, yeah, it's an interesting journey. I don't know how it's going to turn out, whether I have to leave or if I can stay, actually, if, if it's turning into a healthy environment or not. Okay, I'll give you a little tip here. I, I want every one of you to come away with some, some benefit. I don't want to hear, oh, it's very interesting. No, I want you to say, ah, I got the idea. You know, that's, that's what I am. I am a catalyst, whether I like it or not. Right, this is the idea. But 
you influence people more by being nice to them but by being nasty to them. If you can ignore the bad side because people know they've got a bad side and they don't like it, by the way, if you can bring the best out of them, that's the only way. Because if, if you use force to have force, it gets worse. So steal yourself, seal your mouth, you know, try, or, or, or whatever, don't, don't type emails and send them off quickly, you know, bad. There should be a false outbox where you look at the out and say, should I really, do I really want to send that, you know? And it should have a 24-hour delay on it, so you don't regret something. I think in this situation, I'm the one receiving those emails that are being sent to then you thank Then you thank the universe for them and say how interesting they were, and could you clarify? Lead them down the hole, and then they'll, they, they'll realise what they're doing to themselves, you see. Lead them on. Don't fight it. It won't work. Because there's plenty of reptilian energy about us, you see. So the, the neocortex of the person, need, they need to see. Reptile can't see. Reptile is for surviving. Do you know? You talk to them about the reptile brain. They'll, they'll love it. <laughs> I'm naughty some other time. Anyway, let, let's go on. Um, so what does crazy mean? Um, if you wonder about yourself, you're in good company. Albert Einstein said, a question that sometimes drives me hazy, not crazy, am I or the others crazy? Now, Albert Einstein had a fairly good brain. So if he's got that problem, we shouldn't worry about having it. It's okay. You're, you're in the club, you know. Um, a word of caution. We may feel a little bit superior when we see someone in the street wandering around and mumbling to himself or herself. The wise person will say, if I had experienced what this person has had to go through, I would probably be the same. And that's the trouble with judging. You don't no. And people don't give many clues. I once worked with the homeless in London and I went round with the worker and the worker said, there's a chap lying in the street, he said, you wouldn't believe that was a merchant banker six months ago, would you? He lost his job, he's, he divorced his wife and he went bankrupt. He couldn't take it, he was on the street. On the street, lying down and drinking. So, because we don't know, it's better, let's say, to be elegant. Because if you descend to the level, see, any force is taken hold of by other force and dragged down. You won't be dragged up by force, only down, because force is force. I was going to show you this, this lovely diagram of the average person. Uh, it won't show there. Maybe it will. So this is, uh, uh, what do you call now? Not an icon, um, a, a visual um, picture, uh, words. No, no, I can, yeah, 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 that's right, yeah, thank you. So this is the harmony of the heart. It's only black because I'd run out of ink. Uh, and this is earthing. And this is a representation of the various forms of problem. This is what I would like to be, but I can't get it together. These are two options, and I can't decide one or the other. This is me saying, I'm unlovable. And it's like a Mebius strip. It goes around, I'm unlovable, I'm unlovable, I'm unlovable. This is an idea that you tried, but someone blocked it. This is going off at the wrong direction because you were told something wrong, you didn't follow your intuition. I wish I'd followed my intuition. This idea is fairly right. So the problem is that it's all over the place. And I think you could say, you, you might define that as crazy. You might say that. Because I've noticed the so-called crazy people are actually more sane than most of us, but it's oddly packaged. It's a funny, <laughs> strange package, you know? To continue. I always say that we react the strongest to people that we see a little bit of ourselves in. The word crazy comes from, from 
craze, which it means to be mentally unsound. It comes from the Norse, krasa, to crackle, to dash into pieces. I like that. Crasher. It's more than eccentricity. Eccentricity is different to craziness. Craziness is dysfunctional. Eccentricity is having, let's say, an excessive interest in something. So he's very eccentric. He loves writing train numbers. That's not crazy. That's just eccentric. Is the use of the word crazy pejorative? Is it a judgmental thing? Um, you can say I'm crazy about a person. You know, it can also mean that I'm out of my mind and deranged. The problem is that to be ourselves, our real selves, we need to step out of line. So the identification of craziness lies in the need to distinguish between authenticity, what is real, okay, and what is dysfunction, right? So you can mistake one for the other. You think someone's different, actually they're being authentic, actually they're rather functional in their own way, actually they're not crazy. But if you jump too quickly, you may miss out on a great contribution that person has to make, okay? Has anyone had experience of an eccentric person that they found actually quite talented? Any, can you look through your life records and see if you can remember anyone and tell a story. Not mentally, just really speaking is required. Anyone? Are you, all, you just know normal people, yes? <laughs> Don't believe it. Don't believe it. Come on, Steph, you can rescue us. Have you, have you known any dysfunctional person, or apparently dysfunctional person, that was, was helpful? Um, yes, actually. Tell us about it. Yeah. Um, well, I used to work uh, with Asperger syndrome yeah. people, and also I know that you are actually, if you would like to say something, because you are a teacher and you are actually working every day with them. She was just about to, you were just about yeah. to say something. So what is yeah. your contribution? Oh, no. <laughs> They smell different. Yes. No. And it's, true. It's, it's not the. Uh, yeah. It's not the physical smell. It's, it's not the deodorant. It's not yes. Part. It's not a part. It's not a part. <laughs> I, I didn't think it was for a moment. And the first thing. He has actually realized that every teacher has a different kind of smell. Yes. 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 So yeah. I, I know that now yes. how they smell. <laughs> yes, well that's good information. <laughs> so But I think there is many things with them. So yeah, next next see. job you interview for you can <laughs> I like you. <laughs> you know? You you might get a dangerous reputation there, yes. so be be yes. careful, you know. Um now what 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 if you feel you're going crazy? You know, what well, this is this is action now. When you make a breakthrough, awareness will increase. At this time, there are heightened senses, but also heightened vulnerability. Two things will happen, right, as you shift. So you have to shift. It is breakthrough, the breakthrough I make. Yes. It mustn't record it wrong. Yes, OK. Okay, let me just really plug it in there. Don't like it. Hang on. Uh, where was I? Yes. The new skin is naked. 
this is where you need friends to hold your hand, right? It's not a sign of weakness. Now, I, I want you to say that again in Finnish because it's so important. Yeah. So, awareness increases when you make a breakthrough. Yeah. So that's why we need friends. You see. Yeah. It's not a sign of weakness, it's a sign of wisdom. Because if you don't share, it will degrade, it'll go, oh, it was just me. Oh, it's just me. They're terrible. Now, interesting. Problems always come in pairs. First, there's the problem itself, for example, a defect in body or mind. But the second problem is the way you deal with it. There's two things, the problem and how you deal with it. The way you deal with it can make the problem worse. That's another reason for friends. It's very easy to confuse hating the problem with hating yourself. Yes. So psychic people, if there's any here, I don't know. Well, I do actually, but let's say I don't know. Uh, that is a trap. And the more sensitive you are, the more you will feel alienated. And that is not a personality defect. It is not a defect. There's nothing wrong with you. It's just that you can hear, say, classical music. Other people like your beloved heavy metal. For some reason, Finland is the heavy metal capital uh, uh, of the world. The 37 bands per 100,000 population, I think, is huge. And we'll come to that later. I knew you wanted me to talk about heavy metal. Of course you did. Um, so it's very quite simple. Now, you've got to live with yourself 24-7, so we have to talk about living with yourself and avoiding falling into for holes. It's quite simple. You, you have a mental conflict between the problem and yourself. So you think, oh, the problem is me. You know? That's why most people think they're not attractive. Rubbish. The, some of the most attractive women are those who are very insecure. And some of the happiest women are those who are what I call everyday people. So you think you have to plaster your face with stuff? God. The cosmetics industry was started in 1910, I think, by the Rothschilds who wanted a byproduct for the, the, they wanted to use the waste products from the petrochemical industry. Isn't that romantic? You know? I see people put stuff on their face to go to the laundrette. Why? I'm a mere man. You wouldn't expect me to understand that. Of course not. Of course not. But your mind is basically sound, but if it gets two types of information, one of which is right and one of which is not right, you will get a software conflict and you will crash. And no one can tell, but people can go micro-mad. I call it micro-mad because no one can see it, do you see? So I'm giving you all sorts of reason for fellowship. Fellowship is not an optional extra. It is vital for mental health. And it's more important if you're not used to expressing your feelings. Feelings. And you're more likely to have difficulty if your father was a silent person. And many people can spend decades of their life repairing the damage when they were young. 
and you've got used to it so much you think everyone is like that. No, they're not. If you meet someone who was loved from the, the, the moment of the, the, go, the go moment, they have this feeling of self-assurance. And you can be sure that in this room there are probably one or two people who did not receive this love or who, whose parents were not united. And it's amazing how many children blame themselves. They think something I did. What did I do? So this is very difficult for you to love yourself when you think you're responsible for the problems of your parents. Skip that. Yeah. So there's been a huge download from cradle to grave of what is supposed to be information about being normal. We're told what normal is. It's a lie, most of it. Because we are required to be conformative, conformist, excuse me, um, uh, consumers to make money. Normality is a pea-sized perception of possibility. And the P will reject anything outside the definition. So if you try to talk people to, to people about spiritual matters, they will dismiss it as soon as the words are out of your mouth and maybe before. So the question is, which is a very interesting question, do you talk to other people about spiritual things? I would say, if they don't show any interest, you're going, it's going to be more trouble than it's worth. You have to wait for them to ask a question. Wait for them. It may be frustrating, but maybe they're not ready. And if they're not ready, it's like trying to give birth to a child that's four months in term. It doesn't work. And they'll, of course, blame you, you know. So if you add peer pressure, which is the pressure of your group, family pressure, consumerist pressure, media pressure, are you going to individuate, are you going to pop out of this world a robot or an artist? You can only be two things, you see. You can't be half a robot. You're either a robot or you're not. I believe the only way to live is to be a living art installation, to be completely outrageous for most of the time. I mean, David Beckham's covered, by the way, with tattoos, but he, 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 he covers it up with a suit. You know? And it's the same thing. You have to cover up your, your out-of-the-box nature with normality, but actually, you know, you fire away on all cylinders. And heavy metal is not the answer. It just smashes the psychology. Sorry about that. It's going on about heavy. I'll come to that later. Do you see? So I hope that is a little bit helpful about understanding craziness. It's a question of who's looking and what they're thinking. And is craziness a judging statement or is it an observation or is it something said with affection? Right? Because without these people that I call the pepper and salt, society would be very boring if we were all normal. If you look at 1984, everyone is the same, you know, and Brave New World and so on. And the, by the way, that was the 1984 wasn't a prophecy, it was a, um, a warning because George Orwell uh, was friends with Aldous Huxley, who was chairman of the Fabian Society. And the plans to change the world have been in train for a long time. So the only way that George Orwell could warn people was to write 1984 as if it was a novel. But everything he said, alas, is coming true. I think it's even an honor statement. Yes. It's worse than that. It is worse than that. We, we could have a, a special evening on, on, on <laughs> yep. things that are worse. Ah, oh, right, you'd be there like a shot, I know that. <laughs> I have to restrain myself on the political side, you see, otherwise you'll all be <laughs> freak out. Uh, yeah. So why are, why are we in this... Anyone want to say something, by the way? We can jump in. I don't care if you jump in. It's fun when people interrupt, you know? But your fins are very polite. Don't be too polite. Please. Please. Don't be as polite as the Japanese. 
You know, there's too much, you know. Um, wh why are we in this condition? There are a number of types of reasons why we're in this state. I was watching... Um, I woke up early this morning, about six, and I was watching on my device, uh, you know, the shootings in um, Orlando? Orlando, yeah. They showed six or seven what they call crisis actors who come on and pretend to have seen things. And it's so disgusting. It's all about Obama's gun control. You know, he wants, he wants to get events to say people, enough, enough, you know. And it'll go on getting worse until. So really, you see, there's, there's two ways of looking at the world. There's the, 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 the baby food that you're fed by the mainstream media and what's really going on. And if you believe the baby food, you'll actually damage your mind because you're taking on stuff that is drivel. What's drivel? Drivel. Say it. No, 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 you've got to have a better word than that. <laughs> no, I mean, it's BS. Yeah, no, it's worse than that. Okay. It, it's, it's, it's deliberate, you see, and we'll, we'll come to that anyway. Oh, yeah. So, really you understand, and this is, the, this is the worst bit, I have to say it, you know. You have to understand, if you don't want to look at the, the alternative political stuff, there is a backstory, and unless you understand the backstory, you won't understand many of the events that you read about, and it will disturb your mind, and you will get crazy if you believe all the stuff you read. Deary me. I've got a suggestion. Go on holiday for two weeks into a forest, not mozzie time, and talk with nature, and you'll be surprised what you get back. Don't think that because trees can't talk, they can't communicate, because they do. Spend the same two weeks reading newspapers and you'll be a nutcase, because it, it's all hidden agenda, hidden agenda. It's, it, it, it's like this ridiculous stuff in UK about whether we should stick to the uh, uh, European dead horse. So you need some software to deal with idiots. And then you will be less likely to be crazy. You need to say, for, for example, when the, uh, the shooting happened in Paris, I thought, oh yeah, there we go again. And you discovered that the 111 people that were shot, there was actually no blood. No one bled. Because it was all stage managed. The whole thing. Disgusting. But the, the idea is, you see, to bring about a different type of world called the New World Order, which has about 500,000 references in, on Google if you want. Enough, 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 enough. Um, I'm going to try and put this idea forward, which I may ask you to translate. It's called the hidden hand. Um, in astronomy, um, we discover dark planets by inference. In other words, if a star is going on an eccentric orbit, and it shouldn't do, there's something that you can't see that is controlling the gravity. And it's the same with news. If it doesn't make sense, if a politician is speaking oddly, there is a hidden influence. That's fairly clear, isn't it? Yeah. So at a certain level, the politicians are bought and paid for by globalist interests, unfortunately. And they don't serve the country anymore. I mean, look at M Merkel. She's not serving Germany. You know, how high do I jump, Mr. Obama? So if you think that Merkel is serving Germany, you are wrong. Complete, utter, plain wrong. The elite. I'll give you references to that afterwards, because I want to refer to it. But she is not serving. She does what she's told by various other parties who are not German, let's put it that way. I want to keep the lecture balanced. don't want to go completely mad. But there's another factor called political correctness. Do you suffer from political correctness here? You do. There's a slight sign of life there. Tell me about it, yes. You nodded. Yes, we do. Yeah, please tell me about it, because I don't know. <coughs> about the Finnish. 
Yes, the Finnish version of political correctness, yes. I think this is kind of very homogeneous society anyway, so yes. people are too afraid of offending others or um, talking about problems that are sensitive, case sensitive. Okay. For example, yeah, last year the refugee crisis. Yes. And it's people are talking about wrong stuff because they are being politically correct and yeah. okay. being able to talk about real problems because appearing to be labeled as something. Okay. For okay, I'll I'll tell you about political correctness. It was developed by a Marxist group in Frankfurt in 1923 as a way of destroying Western society from within. All right? They moved to, let me see now, let me get it right, New York, and then they moved to, to California, I think. It involves inventing reasons why people might be upset. It means that you cannot tell a joke for fear of it being misunderstood, or you can't address a transgender person as, as she, when she feels more like a, hill, uh, a he. So this is a, a, a deliberate thing to make us afraid. It's all fear-based, you see, as you will know. This man knows. Nice, nice that you came. Thank you. So you know about the blue pill and the red pill. You take the blue pill, this is the matrix, the story ends. You wake up in your bed and believe whatever you want to believe. You take the red pill, you stay in Wonderland, and I show you how deep the rabbit hole goes. So it's a choice whether you've got the courage to look at things as they really are. It's nothing to do with me. Do what you like. But discovering something or realizing something is a million times better than having it invade you suddenly when, let's say, there's martial law in America or something like that. So you have to out-aware the system. You have to be one step ahead of what, is, what might go on and what is going on. You will find your state of mind is much less blown around by the wind. You know, the next outrage, probably a bomb somewhere, another fake, oh, there, there, there they go again, you see. You see, fear and love don't go together. Fear and change don't go together you can be frozen by fear. The more fear you have, the more you can be controlled. Not just by some unknown entities that we haven't talked about, but by each other. That's the real problem. Please don't underestimate it. Um, there's something that I would call self-blocking habits. And this dreadful list com comes to an end very soon, don't worry. There's also self-induced stress, where through pride or embarrassment, you don't share something that is causing stress. What you do is say, it must be, oh, it's just me. How often have I heard that? Oh, it's just me. It's not just you, you need to talk about it. Another more subtle block manifests in what I call fake spirituality, where you imagine that you are a spiritual and superior person. These people are actually, yes. This has nothing to do with either spirituality or superiority. I would call it almost insecurity. Because if you were really spiritual, you wouldn't know, you see. Because if you say, I'm spiritual, it means you have to separate yourself from other people. And that is an unspiritual thing. So my advice to you is, to your own self be true. That's pretty spiritual, eh? And number two, my advice, if you want it, is Meet with friends who bring the best out of you. And, and, and don't have too much to do, maybe, with people that you think, why, why am I with these people talking rubbish, you know? Is that being hard? Yes. But your immortal soul, or the bit that goes on, and that has fallen out again, and I know. Ah, oh, you didn't have to say it. Just, yeah, I'll just hold it. I don't like it, actually, very much. Um, yeah. You see, if we do nothing, we go down. It's like do, 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 do. Because the forces of the world are what we call entropic. 
Newton's second law of entropy, which means that everything breaks down. So you need something the opposite of that to stop this do 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 And I really believe, with a few glorious exceptions, that we cannot do it on our own. I really think, I don't think we're strong enough. I think the disadvantages are too great. So my thinking with, with Steffi, who I've had the pleasure of knowing since, so thank you August, since about January, is that some sort of occasion could be convened where we discuss things and help each other to be stronger. It was just a thought, just, just throw it out there, you know. So what should we bear in mind, this is the end of this session, about how we control our feeling of being crazy? Answer, be aware of what is happening, number one, and, and talk to a friend. You know who your friends are. How are you doing? Fine. How you are doing? Fine. No, you're not. I say fine unless I'm clinically dead. If I'm approaching death, I say I'm fairly fine. I'm pretty good. That means near death. It's all garbage, you know. You know, if, if, you're, not, if you're not well, you ring someone up and say, I'm not feeling too well. Do you mind if we have a coffee or something? If you don't do that, six months down the line, it's more difficult because this carcinogenic effect, is, it, it takes over. If you notice that some people who are divorced, they hate their husband or their ex-husband because he was an absolute monster, the devil incarnate, the source of all my problems at the very least. In fact, you meet him and he's an innocent little man with glasses. I don't, you know. But that's the fantasy, you know. What's happened is that because it's a virus, the hate is a virus, it will insinuate itself, it will, it will replicate. So you'll end up by not hating, you're not trusting everyone and hating everybody, and it will automatically happen unless you stop it. So we say, don't let the sun go down on your anger. Because if you're in bed, you're in an astral place, and you have less control, actually. So if you can forgive any ex-partner or partners or partners that you had because you were attracted to them for a reason which was to learn. That's why you were attracted. Question. Did you learn the lesson? Did you give thanks? If you don't give thanks, you are stuck to them. And I met people in my practice who have separated with some 20 years ago, and they still moan about them. They're caught, you know, like that. Forgive them. The only way out is up. And if you can see, instead of someone who hurt you, they would have hurt anybody who was close. You know, you, you trigger them. You know, it's like an electric fence. You touch it, doom. It's not personal. It's not personal. The damage arrived before you did. <laughs> Got it? It's a mug's game to hate. It does not work. So feel sorry for them. Compassion, you see, is not sticky. Compassion, um, uh, uh, sentiment is sticky. So Jesus, if you're interested in religion at all, he was looked on people with compassion. Compassion is impersonal, it does the job, and it, sends, it, radiates, it radiates love, and that's the only way. Then, you have room in your life for another type of person. So I'll say it again, you met your great friend, your lover, because you needed to learn lessons, because the law of attraction is A, about a law, and B, attraction, law of attraction, get it? And it works 24 hours a day, and it never doesn't work. So you can be freshly divorced, let's say, and you meet someone, and amazingly, they're also freshly divorced. Like attracts like, do you see? So if you want to move on in your relationship and not round and round, divest yourself of their hatred and the, the negativity 
and then you'll go up from 10,000 feet uh, meter, uh, 5,000 meters to 10,000 meters, and you'll meet another type of person. Do you see? It all, it's all in the mind. I'll, I'll do a little demonstration of vibes later if you're interested. I don't know whether you are. Um, but that's all, it's, it never lies, you see. If you hate someone or resentful, you might as well wear a placard saying, I am resentful, because people will pick it up more than you do. You say, oh, I'm a very nice person because I smile and I put lots of makeup on. And people will say, ugh. You know, ugh. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's the trouble, yes. And I'm very excited to meet real people. I, I absolutely love it. I don't care what they look like, couldn't care less. But there's something about them that says, yeah, you know. Um, I, I've got my prejudices like everyone else, and people who chew gum, for example, remind me of something. Uh, but that's the principle. I do try to actually live up to the things I'm saying, you know. I try. So, Thomas Merton says, Art enables us to find ourselves and lose ourselves at the same time. I'm a great fan of art, and I think the therapeutic value of art is absolutely huge. Who does art here at all? The fingers. I'm lucky if I get a finger moving. Yeah, I was playing keyboard. That 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 counts. Not, not yeah. In a long time anymore. Yeah. Yeah. And and yourself? Singing. Wonderful. <laughs> and anyone else had a go? Painting, and she is also painting. Wonderful. Do you understand what I'm saying? You find yourself and you lose yourself. You see, and I think we all need an outlet of some sort. Uh, m one of mine is to is to take gardens or backyards that are totally messy and, and deliver them to the customer and make them nice. And I find that the more spiritual, so called spiritual you focus, the more you need something opposite to balance it. You know, because you can get actually completely obsessed with, for example, politics. It's very easy, you know. So I confess to being fascinated by art and that's why I think we should all be uh, uh, an art installation, which means quite a lot of courage, I must say, you know? It's not easy. Um, and I believe that the creative activity, when you use your higher senses, centres of the mind, creates a, a, a bubble to keep negative thoughts at bay. So in other words, if your aura is working properly, you can walk through any circumstance any situation and you will not be affected because don't forget the law of attraction and it's no good covering up something saying I I hate and someone you say it I hate you know I'm going to love you you know that doesn't work because if the layer third down is carcinogenic it'll catch you and you I occasionally meet people who are transparent and they walk their talk and it's a pri I don't care what they talk about it's just a privilege to be with them. And how sad there are so few of these people around. Um, changing the subject, you had your famous year of the Sisu, didn't you, last year? Sisu. Sisu. Yeah. Did we? <laughs> yeah, that's the question. Yeah, I do. I do, actually. You had a whole year of it. And I, I, I was going to ask you more about it, but since you don't know much about it, I won't bother. Um, yeah. The organiser of the first Sisu lab asked us to remember Einstein's words. Setting an example is not the main means of influencing others, it is the only means. So, if you want to be an evangelist, you act it, and who was it said? talk if you must. So in other words, everything worthwhile we believe in should be obvious without us having to speak about it. Because that's what the aura does. That's its job. That's why we go into a room and get the creeps with someone, although they're immaculately dressed, you know. And other people, person plain as, plain as day. Just an ordinary person, and you think, oh, I feel warm, I feel wonderful. 
So the reason for, as I see it, Steffi, part of your work is to get people free of contradictions because that's the only way forward because you can't storm the gates of heaven, you see. If you become like heaven, become like uh, the person who, who loves, uh, you will automatically attract a different type of person as night follows day. If you're true to yourself, you cannot be false to any man. Yes, Shakespeare. So it is hard work, but we make it hard work for ourselves by not being honest. You know I'm, you know I'm right. Forget about Sissy. Forget about that. Forget about that. I'm looking at the time, of course. Um, cheeky this one. How many people used to be interested in, in heavy metal music, or are? Yeah. You're familiar with Nightwish? Nightwash? Nightwish? Nightwish. <laughs> it's got to say Nightwash, yeah. Yeah, I was, I was looking, uh, watching all their stuff, you know. And it starts off with very soft music and then crash, you know. And I was looking, I've looked at Tura, uh, Turunen. Tarun, yeah, Tari Turun, Tari Turun. Yeah, I'll get that right. And I learned a lot from her because she started with the band. She formed it. She, start, she was a co-founder of it. And in about 2005, the band, I think, wrote her a letter or said, look, your style doesn't fit, you know. Now, whether it was that or the husband, but she, she separated from the band. And to me, this is very uh, symbolic of people separating from a partner, boyfriend, etc. Because you grow out of it. The battery is empty. There's nothing more to give. And when I first heard her voice, Tara, I thought, this is an operatic voice. It's lovely. They got someone else in now, and she's all right. And then she made this amazing, unheavy metal album called Ave Maria, which you wouldn't expect. Uh, and worse than that, Ave Maria en plein air. That was in 19, uh, uh, sorry, 2011. So she's doing something the opposite that you would expect to be produced from a heavy metal environment. So how come? Why did she get involved in heavy metal? Because she had to be there to learn certain lessons. Number one, how to work with a group. Number two, how to perform in front of the public. When she had learned those lessons, she could then move on and go solo, as she did. So if you think back to your friends and, and rela relationships, etc., you had to be there to know what you wanted as well as what you didn't want. It's all right, everyone does it. You didn't make a mistake. Why, why, the friends say, why do you go with him? The answer is the law of attraction, because there were certain things you needed to learn. And then she comes out with this album, Act One, two DVDs, amazing stuff. And, and do you know the first uh, album of Nightwish? The, the title? Angels. Angels Fall First. That's it. Angels Fall First. So we, we go from Angels Fall First to Ave Maria. What could produce that contradiction? So what I'm saying is that contradiction is all right. There's nothing wrong with it. If you have contradictions in your personality, use it. You know? Be crazy. Have fun. Yes? Good. By the way. By the way. What are you doing? Producing such words. <laughs> no. It's a bog. Yeah, that is a place in Lapland, right? I, I know it is. Yeah. <laughs> but are you trying to impress the tourists or something? <laughs> I don't know. It's a bog. Yeah, no. So why, why are you interested in, in heavy metal? I think, it's, uh, I think it's a desire to get free because there are inhibitions, you know? 
in certain ways. Maybe the long winter does it, you know. And however high the government taxes puts on alcohol, you're still drinking, you know. It's, it's a guaranteed way of making money, you know. We go to Estonia and buy it. Yeah. Cheaper. Uh, <laughs> there had to be a reason. He said that I don't have to go to the street and fight with somebody because this music does. Oh, I see. It's a catharsis. Oh, it's a catharsis. Polite. <laughs> That's so polite, isn't it? You don't beat someone up. Oh, that's very finished. <laughs> I'm going to beat someone up on a computer. <laughs> that's the matter. Well, that's something I've learned this evening. Good. Um, right. So I think the, the way through this, the problem is, the problem is, that when we die, and you don't have to believe this, it's all right, you can disbelieve everything. When we die, we go to uh, the sum total of our, let's say, good side and not so good side, goes to another place where we fit in. It's automatic, there's no judging. It's, it's, it, it, it's automatic. Now, this is really going to blow your head off. Believe it or not, Earth is not the only inhabited planet. There are loads of them, with human beings and robotic types, everything, you name it. So we could go anywhere, but the fact that we will go somewhere, because our soul is immortal, it cannot be destroyed. So it is our choice entirely where we focus our belief and where we go in the future. So this whole life, you see, is a lesson. We're here for certain reasons. That's why you met your first boyfriend was a total tyrant. And then the second one was a total creep. And the third one maybe was halfway decent, you see, because you had to experience through learning what's right for you and what's not. How else can you do it? You can't read a book. You've got to do it because it's the interaction of the energy. Boom, boom. That's how to do it. So don't feel bad for making mistakes and don't beat yourself up and say, why did I do it? You did it because of the law of attraction. You did it because you had to learn. Did you learn? Did you give thanks? Right, this is, I, I can see this is a most difficult question. Can anyone identify with a, a so-called dysfunctional relationship from which you benefited, actually, in terms of learning lessons that you decided to be stronger in this way or whatever. Among you, with your average of, say, seven relationships each, can we have that seven times 20? That, say 200, there are 200 relationships in this room overall. Who's going to volunteer and be brave? Something that you learned. If you cannot be your own self with someone, then you are with the wrong person. You've got to tell the story. That's 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 too much. You've got to tell the story. <laughs> <laughs> well, really, if you are with, uh, I I had a bad relationship earlier, and uh, it was really like this. I couldn't speak about anything or do anything what I wanted to do. Yes. I was controlled. Yes. And then I am the And, <laughs> and now it's even worse. Yeah. <laughs> 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 yeah, so the lesson to draw from that is Well, I learned my lesson. Good. Yeah. Good. Did you learn any lessons? Do you mean romantic relationships? Oh, <sighs> romantic. Oh. Yes. More like in other kind of relationships. Okay, non romantic ones. Mm -hmm. What do you think? Okay, that's fine. Uh, uh, let me share for you. Let me do it for you. This is not breaking any confidences. I think the friends you have is a reflection in part of the image you have of yourself. Not you, I'm just speaking generally now, you see. And if you're down on yourself, maybe too hard on yourself, then you'll get ambivalent friends, so to speak. And it all comes back to the time in the womb where when you were conceived, 
you know, that sort of thing. You had a certain disposition, male and female. If you had to be on the defensive, the male side will go artificially high to protect yourself, do you see? But that's not, it's, it sits awkwardly with you. It doesn't feel right somehow. And therefore your friendships and relationships always seem to go wrong. Right. I'm not saying you, I'm just talking about Jeff, understand. And so the reason that some of you I know have been to therapists and taken pills and blah, 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 is that the, the therapist has not gone back far enough. They've said, how does it feel? How do you feel about this? So they block off anything before birth. You see, you're in the waiting room, yes? Blood circulating round blood containing iron, iron containing magnetic fields of course, magnetic fields containing thoughts. So you get the thoughts of your mother, particularly. So if your mother was ambivalent towards your father, you come out wondering why. That's what happens. And that's what I do if I have a little plug on my work at this point, I go back to early times and, and have a look at what might be preventing you from moving on. Because my only interest is in people moving on. And the damage happened before you could do anything about it, so don't blame yourself. Right? Don't do it, waste of time. If you could not help it, other people have the ability and the right to say, well, I, I, you haven't messed yourself, you see. I'll look at someone else. You haven't messed yourself. It's, you were messed up before you could do anything about it. And that's the tragedy. I, I did a, had a client once who, let me see now, uh, at the age of six months we discovered her parents decided they didn't want her. So she started a scheme, and the schemes never went to fruition. They always collapsed. They were almost self-sabotaged halfway along because she was so used to that pattern of looking forward to coming and then, oh, I'm not wanted. So she, she created things in her life to mimic this, to be like it. It's fascinating really good. I could go on forever, but it's the time. Anyway, I'll, I'll show you this original thing, which I was doing. I hope that in one respect, you might have maybe wobbulated or shift a little way. Just a tiny thing. Because don't forget, our souls have been around for so many years and centuries in one form or another. Change is difficult. It's hellish difficult. But it's easier if we can trust people who are our friends. No trust, no friends, very difficult. Lots of trust, lots of nice people, easier. But in this rubbish world, tough. Tough, tough. That's it. I've stopped. <laughs> it must be the end then. <laughs> must be the end. Uh, right. So, so I'll give you feedback on yourself. Uh, I find I'll give you nine nine out of ten for attention. I thought you'd be a little bit more forthcoming, but I do I do agree. I'm a, I'm a bit much for most people the first time you know, to get used to. But once you realise that you're an art installation, and everyone can be an art installation, it does bring a great freedom, and it's great fun. So I will talk to anyone with a pulse, who I see in the street, and they love it. Anyone, anywhere. Even women on their own, I do it. The rule with women on their own, by the way, of course you know this, in an art gallery, you comment on something, but you stand a certain distance away, you know? And then you don't move around after them. You, you move away, because otherwise they'll think you're after them. You know? 
That's my tip for the day. Maybe that's the most important thing I said. All the rest is rubbish, you know. I don't know. Right. Let's do another one. Okay. There are, I'm, I'm here for a few days. What I do is, um, I look at your, your chakras. I think you're into chakras, yes? No, that could turn off. Yeah, turn it off. Uh,